Queen Elizabeth II was Britain's longest reigning monarch, having occupied the throne for over 70 years. However, with her recent passing, I thought it would be fitting to look back on a period before these 70 years, when she was just Princess Elizabeth. I'm the Enlightened Edelweiss, and in this video, we'll be taking a look into the life of Princess Elizabeth in the Second World War. With the start of the war in September of 1939, Princess Elizabeth was only 13 years old. Her sister, Princess Margaret, had only just turned nine. Preceding the declaration of war, the royal family was in Balmoral Castle in Scotland. King George VI and the Queen Consort returned to London in late August. However, they weren't accompanied by their children, who stayed in Scotland where it was more safe. There were suggestions to evacuate the princesses to Canada due to the concern of German bombings across the UK. This, however, was not to be the case, as Elizabeth's mother, the Queen Consort, also named Elizabeth, said that the children wouldn't leave without her, she wouldn't leave without the king, and the king would never leave. Elizabeth and Margaret moved to Sandringham at Christmas of 1939, following which they moved to Royal Lodge until May of 1940, when they were finally moved to Windsor Castle for additional safety. Their location was kept a secret. For a period of time, the king and queen stayed with their daughters at Windsor. However, they soon returned to London after the worst of the Blitz was over, and stayed there for the remainder of the war, visiting their children only on the weekends. It was around this time, in October of 1940, that Princess Elizabeth made her first ever radio broadcast, intended for British children who had been separated from their families due to the war. The broadcast also had the secondary aim of influencing the American public and government's opinion on the war. This is the BBC Home Service. Hello children everywhere. This is one of the most important days in the history of children's hour. Some time ago, we were honoured by the visit to the studio of the King and Queen with Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret during the broadcast of a Tritown programme. Today, Princess Elizabeth is herself to take part in the Children's Hour and speak to the children of the Empire at home and overseas. Listeners in the United States of America will also hear this broadcast. Her Royal Highness, Princess Elizabeth. In wishing you all good evening, I feel that I am speaking to friends and companions who have shared with my sister and myself many a happy children's hour. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. To you living in new surroundings, we send a message of true sympathy. And at the same time, we would like to thank the kind people who have welcomed you to their homes in the country. All of us children who are still at home think continually of our friends and relations who have gone overseas, who have traveled thousands of miles to find a wartime home and a kindly welcome in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the United States of America. My sister and I feel we know quite a lot about these countries. Our father and mother have so often talked to us of their visits to different parts of the world. So it is not difficult for us to picture the sort of life you are all leading and to think of all the new sights you must be seeing and the adventures you must be having. But I am sure that you too are often thinking of the old country. I know you won't forget us. It is just because we are not forgetting you that I want, on behalf of all the children at home, to send you our love and best wishes to you 
and to your kind hosts as well. Before I finish, I can truthfully say to you all that we children at home are full of cheerfulness and courage. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers and airmen. And we are trying too to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war. We know, every one of us, that in the end all will be well, for God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. And if I may be allowed, I would like to say what is in the minds of all the children listening. Thank you, Princess Elizabeth, very much for broadcasting in the children's hour. The broadcast was a huge success worldwide and even made the front page of many newspapers in the United States. In fact, the broadcast was so successful that the BBC sold gramophone records of it. During their time at Windsor Castle, the princesses lived a largely comfortable life, and they both remembered the time fondly in their later years. They were, however, still subjected to rationing and air raid drills like the rest of the country. In 1942, Princess Elizabeth was appointed Honorary Colonel of the Grenadier Guards, and she undertook her first appearance as such on her 16th birthday that year, inspecting the guards at Windsor Castle with her father at her side. In 1943, it was noted that while she would soon turn 18 and be able to succeed her father as monarch without the need of a regent, she would still technically be unable to fill in for her father as Counselor of State until she was 21. The law was changed and she served in her father's place in 1944 when he visited Italy. In February of 1945, Princess Elizabeth joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service and was registered as number 230870, 2nd Subaltern Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor. While her rank was honorary, the training she underwent as a mechanic and driver was not and she would later remark that it was the first time that she was able to seriously test her abilities against others of the same age. The official report stated that the princess was to be treated no differently from the other soldiers, and her mother emphasized this by requesting that photographers not be present. However, in practice, this was not to be the case, as Elizabeth's time in the army was to be one of the most photographed periods of her life and one could argue that her role as a symbol and morale booster in propaganda surpassed that of her role as a regular soldier, and as a result she was hardly treated in the same manner as her fellow soldiers. That being said, she did take on her share of work in the army, and abided by the schedule of the Auxiliary Territorial Service's mess. Shortly before the war's end, she was promoted to junior commander. Upon the defeat of Nazi Germany on the 8th of May 1945, Large crowds gathered in front of Buckingham Palace to celebrate. That night, Princess Margaret suggested that she and Elizabeth venture out into the crowd in disguise to experience the victorious evening as ordinary people. The king and queen accepted, and a small party departed from the palace into the streets of London, unrecognized in the grand chaos of the celebrations. Following the defeat of Japan in August, Princess Elizabeth and Margaret attempted to once again venture out into the crowd incognito. However, this time they were recognized, and a crowd of people gathered around them before police intervened and they were returned to the palace. The then Princess Elizabeth had only been a child when the war began in September of 1939. By the time of its end six years later, she was a veteran, had served on behalf of her father as a counselor of state, and had undertaken the first steps to becoming a fully working royal in the public eye. Well folks, that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching, I hope you found it useful, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.